So uh, welcome, Karen and Alexis, and we're, we're looking forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so first, Karen and I wanted to thank the, uh, Stephanie Plunkett and the entire staff of the Norman Rockwell. It is such an honor to be here. Um, we kind of feel like we have to pinch ourselves. You know, we're on the same piece of paper with uh, Tony DiTerlizzi and Holly Black's name. So it's not every day that happens. Uh, so thank you so much to the Rockwell and all the amazing staff um, that they do here for inviting us. Um, secondly, it feels very comfortable for us to be presenting to students. Um, Lenox is um, a combined middle high school. We work with students grades 6 through 12. So what that means, as all of you know, is that we're used to getting a lot of eye rolls. We're used to getting lots of quizzical uh, looks, lots of, you know, head slapping when we say something people don't like. So uh, it actually will make our life easier if you give us that sort of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my very first faculty presentation. I presented to adults and it was so completely bizarre to me because everyone was sort of the polite blank stare <laughs> and I didn't know kind of if I was making sense or not. So please um, interject, raise a hand if we're going too quickly, if a point has not been made clear, please let us know because that, that will actually help us and uh, we'll feel a little bit more at home. So, um, and actually a third, a third thing before we begin. Karen and I have both, and I'm sure you have as well, attended many conferences, and it has this beautiful title, The State of Reading, Art and Fiction in the Classroom. And you sign up for it, and you go, and at the end of the day, you say, at the end of the session, you say, huh, art and fiction in the classroom, is that really what they spoke about? And so we're going to kind of uh, affirm the fact that our throughout the process of working together and creating this presentation, things changed. Um, it is very loosely about art and fiction in the classroom, but it's a lot about a lot of other things. So we just want to kind of own that when you go home and you say, that's not what they talked about. We know that that's not really what we talked about. Um, and then finally, sort of to, be, to, to begin, we didn't feel that it was fair to really get into our work without unwrapping sort of what it means to be an educator today. And because I'm surrounded by educators, I think that you will all feel this in some way or another. But it's not always, it's, it's certainly a privilege to be an educator, but it's not always the easiest thing to be an educator. Um, I'm not going to answer that sort of rhetorical question, but you know, with Betsy DeVos at the helm, there's, to say that there's a lot of tension in the world of education is perhaps fair. Um, and um, it's one of those pers professions, right, where, oh, everybody, I went to school, therefore I know how to teach, right? You hear that a lot. Um, and there, it's, 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 it is a tricky job. Another thing that we are always you feel, you know, we, we hear it at our monthly faculty meetings, there's more and more state, you know, uh, unfunded state mandates, more and more data collection, more and more paperwork, right? All of the things that made us all really excited about getting into the profession of education, like data, right, and reporting to the states and, you know, having an ELAR and logging into DESE, that's what we talk a lot about. And we're just sort of here to take a moment saying that's not what anybody is passionate about. Right, and that there's this balance that you feel that all of your energy is chasing this monster and we are sort of wondering why this monster is even here. Um, another thing I think that needs to be dis at least not discussed but acknowledged is that we are not simply asked to cover art and ELA or library science. No, educators fail and will always fail because we're supposed to teach the children and we're supposed to provide a sound athletic setting and we better have the right mascot. You know, those of you who are in Berkshire County, you know, there's all this kerfuffle. There always will be. Lennox are the millionaires. Whew, you know, it's like the list goes on and on. Um, we are dealing with students. We're supposed to also nurture um, character development. Uh, are we meeting the social, social emotional uh, needs of our students? What are we doing about drug counseling? What are we doing about drugs in our building? What are we doing about parents who are on drugs? Um, what are we doing about teen pregnancies? What are we doing about the products of teen pregnancies that are in our classroom? What are we doing about homelessness? Are, you know, how many of our students are homeless and how are we serving those needs. Um, what are we doing about poverty? Um, what are we doing about ELL, you know, English language learners? Um, are we you SEI endorsed right now? Um, have you done that certification or are you still need to work on it? Um, what are we doing about, uh, you know, the obesity epidemic in this country? 
And I think that, of course, all these things are important and huge things, but at some point, we as educators, I hope, and this is my view, need to say, look, She's going to create a wonderful space where students can do art. And I'm going to do my hardest to create a wonderful space where students can interact with text. As a whole of society, we need to start realizing that these do not, should not be falling simply on teachers, educators' shoulders. So we wanted to kind of say that simply because that's what, for those of us who teach, that's a daily, we deal with that on a daily basis. And I think it's very, um, it's not fair for us to say, hey, we're going to talk about art in ELA without recognizing this is the framework with which we're working on a daily basis. So we are not going to answer any of those questions, of course, but at least sort of acknowledging, um, acknowledging the situation that we're working in. Um, and I think this is where Karen and I are very much kindred spirits, and I imagine everyone in this room is because you've taken a Saturday out of your very busy lives to come to a museum and listen to authors and artists speak. Um, but there's this great fear that, you know, Tony was talking upstairs about boredom and having, un, you know, having this space to let the joy of learning seep in, to problem solve, to be creative. And it very much sometimes feels in an educational system that this really, you know, what we're being told is that we need to meet um, data benchmarks. You know, we need to be doing benchmark testing, and we, we have to be doing all of these data gathering pieces, and there's really very little conversation in our, from our perspective about this, which is actually why we joined up in the first place, right? So there's this incredible tension right now. However, that's where we come in to say, don't forget about this stuff. So yes, we're worried about the data, and sometimes they'll turn to me and say, do you think you could emphasize, do you think you could enhance, do you think you could enrich our math curriculum in your art room? Absolutely, absolutely I can. Now I need to make those choices of still maintaining that joy of learning, which I can certainly do, but they can't forget about art, so I need to make sure that I keep us all involved. So that's fair, that's all well and good, that's what the state wants us to know and pay attention to, that's fine. But we're going to carry on about the joy of learning and doing so. Right, and it's really about kind of, I think, we're trying to carve out time in order to have that happen, to protect students, to have that space happen, um, given the environment in which we all work. So I'm going to begin by talking about challenges in the library. Um, one thing that has struck me more and more, and I sort of, I sort of said this is a bit uh, redundant from what I, my remarks earlier, but essentially we're seeing this change that um, the best way to, to become, have a child become literate is actually not through breaking down and teaching verbs and parts of speech and mechanics and sentence structure. Actually, the way to make a lifelong reader is to inspire that child with beautiful artwork and beautiful language and beautiful stories, right? So again, as Tony was saying upstairs, we are, you know, by, you know, Homer knew this so long ago, we are storytellers. We love a story. And if you can, we firmly believe that if you can really all the other chatter about everything else, if you can kind of protect that story space, that's where you're actually going to inspire your lifelong learners. So if you pause for a minute and think about if you have children or if you have nieces or nephews or anybody small, that you, how do you begin their life? You begin by talking to them. You begin by telling them stories. You begin by reading them stories. You don't begin by asking them to write their name or how to spell it. So likewise, um, I have a bilingual family, and when my children were born, we had to decide, how are we going to create this atmosphere of learning in French and in English? And it was precisely that way. My husband spoke in French exclusively. He told stories exclusively in French, and I in English. And then when it was appropriate for them to begin to write, they wrote in both preschool in English and then at home in French, which are the same letters, fortunately, but it, it does make a difference. But that's how they began as well. So a lot of people question, like, well, that, make, that doesn't make sense that your, your son is in French class. He should know it. Well, if we didn't take English class as Americans, as English learners, 
we wouldn't know it either. So we do have to fall back on what, what, what we naturally do. We tell stories and then we can continue from there. And isn't it wonderful to add in pictures so that we can then dissect and break down some of those visual clues. Right, and I also know through talking with Karen, her husband is a French teacher um, in southern Berkshire, and there's a shift in the world in the manner in which we are teaching, the world, and modern languages are, are teaching language. It used to start with the mechanics and the breakdown, and now it's actually, there's a shift in that whole department, in that whole discipline, rather, of saying, actually, no, we have to, again, it's, it's always going back to the very beginning. You have to start with the story. Um, something I... I will not spend too, linger too much on because I'm quite frustrated about this topic and nobody wants to listen to me spout my frustrations. Um, but I do see an incredible trend in education that for some reason administrators, and I know I'm probably surrounded by administrators, there's probably administrators in the classroom, so I, I don't know, I'd love to talk to them and figure this out, but generally speaking, it seems that administration and school leadership is very willing to put their money in curricular packages and in products. It's, they're much more uncomfortable finding good professional development and training to uh, keep uh, attracting and retaining really good people. And for the life of me, I don't understand why that is. I can tell you, and this, you know, forgive me for saying incredibly arrogant, but I can tell you, and I know all of you can tell me, think about your buildings. You know who are the really passionate teachers. Why is it so much easier to sit through a school committee meeting and hear that they're going to be spending an incredible amount of money on a new math program or a new literacy program, and my biggest frustration, a leveled reading program? And yet we're not, we're not going to spend, we're not going to, we're not going to possibly think outside that box and reach out to Norman Rockwell Museum and see if we can get an illustrator to come and teach our students and have this amazing learning moment. Why does that, why is that so hard? I don't have the slightest clue, but it's probably my biggest educational frustration. You have young teachers who are earnest, who are passionate, and they're either not supported or for whatever reason, you've got administrators willing to waste an immense amount of time and effort and resources on finding some packaged program that for those of us who have been in education long enough know that you're going to move classrooms and you're going to find boxes and boxes and boxes of textbooks, you know, and cardboard that was made in the 80s that has not faded a, a moment because they weren't used. And I don't know how many of those packets I've thrown out, and I'm not even that old, right? So that's, again, I'm getting angry. We're going to move to the positive. I'm letting so, Karen take over. <laughs> so wasn't it wonderful to hear Tony say that he has these teachers that he could thank, that he could reach out to and say that this is what moved him forward? And so that's, that's what we're all there for. And to bring in Jerry Pinckney, thanks to the Norman Rockwell Museum and our, our collaboration and connection together, is incredible. It's really unbelievable to have such an amazing individual come into our schools. So to hear about Holly Black and Tony DiTerlisi doing the same, you know that they are influencing those students. And very often, we don't hear that immediately. But, um, but I, we are very fortunate in Lenox to be very well supported by our community, by our school committee, and in the arts, it's kind of unheard of to not only maintain your program, but to grow it. And every time I ask for something, that's reasonable. And because I've been there for 20 years, I think they trust that my requests are reasonable. They agree to them, or we find a way to make it happen. So, um, so to, to make this happen was wonderful, because the Rockwell, could, we could reach out and work together. But maybe that wasn't originally in my budget. But that's okay. We still made it happen. But it is one of the very first things that they will cut from me. So that's why the partnerships are so amazing. They will not cut my supplies because they know that those are dispensable. And we need paper. We need pencils. The kids can't do art without it. But they will cut my professional development and they will cut our guest speakers. So I've got to find a way to get them back in without the kids feeling that little ripple. And that's fine. That's my job, and I love doing it. So that's okay with me. 
Um, another uh, challenge I see in the library, and again, it's so interesting that, that I think we heard upstairs uh, Dieter Lisi and Black um, echoing this as well. Um, I, before I became a librarian, I was an English language arts teacher. And you do see this, I believe, more in ELA than in, in library science. But we need to, there's a lot of sort of judgment in the ELA world, right? There's good literature and there's bad literature. There's good, there's literature and then there's books, right? Or however we want to call it. But there's very much, um, well, you know, in sixth grade, or they shouldn't, sort of like his um, mouse and the motorcycle, right? Like, well, you shouldn't possibly be reading that. And I think we need to just get over that. I really think we need to get over that. Um, and we need to see, again, it's, a, it's, it's sort of amazing how nicely it dovetails. Um, again, recognizing that picture books are valuable for all learners, K through 108. <laughs> Who doesn't like to be read to? You know, Karen had said, chatting about this yesterday, you open a picture book and you have a captive audience. It doesn't matter. So one thing that I have done, um, the packet that you have, the first sheet, The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. Um, can I see a uh, show of hands? Who knows this story? OK, so I'm go it's a total spoiler alert. You probably all know it, though you may have forgotten it. Um, it's a short story. It was uh, written by O. Henry. It's, a for, it's, it's written for adults. The language is incredibly challenging. Um, this is the sheet that I, so I've started recently for the past several years. I do this with my sixth grade students uh, th through their reading class. If you just scan some of the vocabulary, it's far above a sixth grade reading level. But we do, you, they each get this little half sheet, and I read them this story, right? It's a beautiful story yeah, of the woman, yeah. right? It's a husband and wife. She cuts her hair because the only thing she has. She sells it to get her husband a pocket watch, uh, chain for his watch, rather, and he sells his great-grandfather's watch to get her combs, right? I mean, sixth graders just melt when you get to the end, and they're figuring mm -hmm. it out and putting it together. It's just such a moving, incredible story. And so I was so happy to find this illustrated copy by P.J. Lynch. And again, this is how it begins. The, it's very challenging. It's a challenging story. It's an adult story. But they can read it because we talk about it and we give it space. And so, A, they're captivated by the imagery. Um, there's so much richness in bringing in illustrated texts. Um, and we hear a lot in education of this concept of universal design, right? Universal design came out of the field of architecture. It's um, if, someone in a if, if someone in a wheelchair needs a ramp, actually a ramp helps everybody, right? To try to not sort of all of these things um, that help some people actually end up helping everybody. And um, I'd really like to sort of promote uh, illustrated text as being sort of good for everybody. I think now. So then we move into the challenges of visual arts, and I'm not talking about the messy cleanup or any of that kind of stuff that happens. So here is an example of one of my students' work that was just recently completed, just last week, I believe. And one of my biggest challenges is trying to get them to be their own independent, unique problem solvers. So they need to be constantly encouraged. They need to be constantly told to do their own thing. And then with these things, there's so much we can cover. So I concentrate on the elements and principles of art. I concentrate on line, shape, color, form, texture, all these sorts of things. And in sixth grade, this is a sixth grade project. This is called a self-portrait. They can't be wrong. It's about them. They know themselves far better than I know them. Actually, my sixth graders, that's my first year with them. So this is a project they should have great confidence in, because I can't tell them, no, I, I, did, you know, I didn't know that about you, but good for you. Um, but it's interesting how they still falter, and they're still not sure. And I think that goes back to the whole data-driven quest that they want to know the answer because everybody else wants them to know the answer and wants them to have the high score. So then we go back to judgment. So whether you're judging the books or whether you're judging their art. At this age, they think whatever is illustrated beautifully is good art. And so it's really hard to break that if they don't come in with confidence. I think my next one, thank you. So when I had a sub last week, because I had professional development time to work on this with Alexis, um, 
I had asked the students to make a flip book. We were talking about motion. We were going to do kinetic sculptures, but we weren't there yet. So we were talking about the idea of movement. We had already done comics and sequential visuals, and now we were going to do a little flip book. So my example to them was this little one here that was done by a student that was a little mountain, and basically the sun would rise um, and set. So when I came back, to see the assignments done. Oh, Mrs. Leger, those were really fun. Those were really great. That was a really great day. I had eight pretty much exactly the same. Some were colored in more, some were colored in less. One was a volcano. But the rest were really the same thing as my example. And so that's where they default to being safe. And they struggle with the idea of coming up with their own solution. And I know it's the age. But isn't that our job to then push them forward? So this is where I give all my students sketchbooks. They're not big. The, the sixth graders have little pocket ones. And there's 24 pages in the book. And I tell them that I've saved all my sketchbooks from all my years. And they're full of terrible drawings because they're my ideas. They're not my finished, polished, beautiful sketches, drawings, paintings. They're my ideas and that they should not rip those out because those are all there as a starting point. So they are uncomfortable with that idea. They're uncomfortable with that process. Even though they've been brought up with that through writing, they do a first draft, they do a second draft, they do their final draft. But in art, they all want to be the best first time. So the process is really a challenge to them. And again, I get that saying of, but I can't draw. Can I, can I just find somebody else's image? And then I can draw that. I can redraw that. And that's OK. They can do that on their own. They can do that in their sketchbook. But when I'm trying to encourage them to become a more sophisticated artist, I want to hear that from them, because they're each all their own unique, wonderful selves. So they, this artistic process, to me, is so wonderful because I'm comfortable. But I realize that half the room is paralyzed in fear of where do I begin? Where do I start? This is, and this is so interesting, right? Again, when you're given time to work with an educator with whom you respect, and you're given a little bit of space from all that dull roar of data collection, I said, oh my gosh, this is exactly in the library what my students are also struggling with. So two different processes, but something that we have identified as being a real change, even in the past 10 years, five to 10 years in education, um, is that students are very paralyzed by jumping off. And I think that this kind of is the, uh, you know, jumping off this, this terrified little boy looking over the diving board from Rockwell's 1947 image, I think, kind of is the personification of this issue. Um, if you look at your sheet, and I realize I'm, so because I, I work in a high school, the second sheet, it's only there to make uh, the point. Um, so I also, I do a major project in the spring with my juniors. And, or excuse me, so to prep them, so this past fall, we started with a smaller project on, a research project on immigration. So feel free to give me feedback, but I really thought that this worksheet, which you're not going to read now, but it sort of says, okay, follow the steps, you know, follow the following steps, redundant, and success will be achieved, ignore them, and it's not going to work. So after probably a week of modeling, I had pulled, I had told them what the reference collection was. We talked about um, how things are organized. I used a document projector and took, there were two reference sets that I had pulled off the shelves for them, put on a little cart, and I named them here, right? So those two bullets, these are two, one's a four volume and one's a three volume. I modeled, this is how you access content in a four volume, this is how you access content in a three volume modeled it all, showed it to them. To say that there were tears over where they needed to start is not an understatement. And this has been happening a lot recently. And I think actually to sort of step outside for a moment, um, I've been doing a study for PDPs on anxiety. And it turns out that at this moment in, in our time, anxiety is the number one uh, mental health problem in the United States. They are so anxious. I can't answer or tell you why. I mean, they're so, that's such a complex problem. I can't sort of begin to crack that nut. I mean, I can, but 
<laughs> we can do that over a glass of wine. You don't want to hear me about <laughs> with that now. But it was really fascinating that this whole ability that I didn't experience in my educational process, Karen didn't experience, um, we were really comfortable with the process. It was okay, right? You didn't know where you were going, but you would kind of edit and revise. We don't see that resiliency in our students. And we are really fascinated by this and troubled by it, but also trying to figure out, okay, I can't change society, but you know, how can we, how can we kind of help? So the bad news is, as, as is not a surprise to anybody, is that we don't have a clue what the solution is. <laughs> Uh, the good news is, is like Sisyphus, um, uh, you know, pushing that boulder forever up the hill, um, we are hoping to kind of give you some suggestions of a process that's worked for us that we've been able to kind of make space for students to learn a little bit, hopefully, maybe. Um, so to dive right into the process. When I first started teaching English language arts with sixth graders, you know, a, a, a wonderful unit um, that is still actually being taught, you know, it's, it's still in the, in the frameworks. Um, you know, it's very common. You uh, research fables from around the world. You, you know, research Aesop's fables. You put students in front of this, and then, of course, you have them write their own fable, right? So I'm going to leave, I'm going to now um, hand things over to Karen because she is, She's going she's gonna to explain where there's some tension here. So, th so that's wonderful. From an ELA teacher's point of view, they're going to write a fable. They're going to understand all of, that need, all of what needs to be learned in that assignment. However, my question is, can we capitalize on that moment? Because often, teachers want to offer these other things to go along with that writing component. So create a cover create an illustration. Create a cover. This is an example. Cover must be 18 by 24 and there cannot be any white. Why? How does that make sense? I'm not sure. And, and for, <laughs> for the record, I was like, yeah, it sounds good. All right. Cover. <laughs> right? I don't know. I'm, this sounds fine to me. And it was Karen who said, whoa, 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 whoa. The problems with this are that... This is enormous. 18 by 24 is huge. So, number one, you've got this child who's writing their fable and then coloring all night long so that there's no white. There's no thought of color. They just know they got to get color in there. Make it look good. Well, what is good? Here we go again back to judgment of the art, which is not a bad thing in some realms. But when we're talking about an ELA fable cover and we have no objectives for the art, then there's not it doesn't really add up. Then why couldn't we say, actually, why don't you identify the key moment, identify the climax of that story and illustrate it? Why can't that be the cover? Or why can't the character be the cover? And then choose the appropriate size paper. One, so that they're not spending th two hours coloring the whole thing. And also because what is the purpose of it? Is it going to be for a book? Is it going to be published? Let's make this realistic in the sense of potentially a career opportunity or career exploration. And, and then the color emphasis. So we talk a lot in sixth grade and in seventh grade about color choices and then color emphasizing a mood. So this story is wonderfully hysterical. Um, and the red clearly emphasizes the mood and its complementary colors to, to create that kind of, that, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Anna? That, mm -hmm. yeah. The tone, the climax. So when you're the... using complementary colors, then you're going to create that, that idea of vibration. And it's not really soothing. You don't really like to look at complementary colors next to each other. But the story is actually about paper and scissors. It's a riot. So this it turns <laughs> out that, um, so as an ELA teacher, mood, uh, topography, choice of color is not my wheelhouse. So Karen and I, just, I said, okay, how do we make this work, right? How do you, how do you, how do you capitalize on that teachable moment and really, really make it valuable for, for students from every angle? Well, what you don't have, this is, this is probably one of the most hysterical stories I've ever, I've ever had a student write. This is called Paper and Scissors, and the moral of the, the story, because every fable must have a moral, 
The moral of the story is don't run with scissors. <laughs> it was so cleverly done. And so you have uh, this sheet of paper who you know, doesn't take anybody's advice. He is in a track meet and he trips and falls over scissors. Right? And that's how that child told a fable after reading Aesop's and you know, whatever. Um, so it's, it was a stitch. It's hysterical. And it was able to be such a better learning moment because here I am in the ELA classroom saying, OK, you know what, she everything has to be on moral and blah, 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 and doing all of her drafting. But at the same time, just like Tony DeTerlizzi was saying upstairs, I've got to read this story, this fable, and I have to, in the art classroom, right, I've got to identify that. OK, what's that moment going to be? How am I going to tell that story, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we feel that there's so many opportunities in a daily in, in the life of a classroom to collaborate, but they often don't happen. Um, this is another, these were two others that we just thought that were fabulous. We have Mr. Cow and Ms. Parrot. We have a tale of two cows. But again, lots of thought <laughs> given to how the illustration is going to complement the text. Um, you know, this is eventually obviously published. Um, but it's just, it's such, a, it's such a great moment for the students, right? They're so proud of this because they do recognize when it's good, right? We, uh, and that's part of just being human. And so wasn't it great to hear Tony say something about collaboration and how important that was? Because as, he, as we've seen and a lot of heads were nodding upstairs about that question of kids being bored, I think that a lot of kids also have a hard time figuring out how to collaborate. They know how to play their online games. I remember the first time I saw my son playing his, his, uh, on his phone on a game, and I was like, okay, what are you doing? He's like, no, I can't right now, because my other clan member is depending on me. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Shut it off. But that was his way of collaborating, and fair enough. That's what's happening now, but in the real world of where we are right now, we need to be able to talk and communicate. So I think that it is, it is wonderful to try to not only have the kids consider two different disciplines, but also see us modeling that communication and that collaboration because it's necessary and then in my room we also then consider like where are we going to display these so we need to then communicate um, and I just had one of our custodians give us a really hard time because I had sixth graders carrying these big display boards that are twice their size but they're super light um, and he was giving me a hard time about like what are they doing what did they do to make you made them do this and I said no this is all part of the learning process this is not easy, and they need to also learn this. And they're not heavy. They just are making it look really awkward. <laughs> so, um, so I think that there's a lot to be said in trying to consider that whole picture as opposed to just your specific discipline. Right, and I think to echo again to, sit to what Karen is saying as well, that as the ELA teacher, modeling that collaboration, modeling that process to students and saying that there is so much value, there's equal value given to the art you produce in the art classroom with Ms. Leger, to the writing you produce in the library of the ELA classroom, the modeling of that <laughs> collegial support is also something that our students really need to hear, okay? Um, we talked, this is kind of an interesting um, moment, so there's all these hackneyed expressions about education, right? And one of them is that, oh, you always have to teach your strengths. And we realized kind of as we were tangling out our thoughts for this and teasing things out that the flip side of teaching to your strengths is you have to be ready to admit your weaknesses. I have no background in the fine arts. Karen studied the fine arts. I have no background, you know, I have I've taken zero art history courses. As a librarian, that's kind of my Achilles heel. I, I love the arts, but I've never taken a formal class. And my first couple years as a librarian, I was really insecure about that. Um, we as educators, and maybe it's because we're not in an environment where we feel supported enough to do that, right? That takes some guts to say, I don't know that. For the librarians in the room, I've... I'll share with you, it's, that's very hard to sort of be a librarian. I don't have all the answers. I can find them for you, but I don't, you know, I'm not, I have not studied every discipline under the sun. And that took me a long time to be okay to accept. I felt very intense inside and, 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 and um, uncomfortable. So I need to be able to say to my students, I don't really know much about this. I don't understand it. 
What an amazing opportunity for all of us to tap into Ms. Leger's expertise and learn from her. And how can we better this project or better our practice by doing that? And I think that particularly in the field of education, Yes, we've come a long way from the, you know, sort of sage on the stage where the teacher knows everything, but I don't know if uh, really in our brains we totally accept that. We are supposed to have the answer, and it can be very terrifying to accept and sort of put your vulnerability out there and say, I don't have the slightest clue. And I think actually being a librarian has helped me a lot with that because I'm often in that position. <laughs> so maybe it's that I feel more comfortable doing it now because there's so many times, you know, the PhD with history comes to me and says, oh, rah, 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 you know about this. I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But <laughs> give me a few minutes and I'll get back to you next. <laughs> but I do think that a real collaboration, you have to be able to share with your students, hey, this is going to be so exciting. We're going to learn all this stuff that I don't know. And I'm not sure we are supported sometimes. Whoa! Enough to do that. Sorry. Blah, blah. Um, so that was kind of another aha moment in our thinking, that teachers need to be supported. They need to be given, you know, there's always team time, but how much are you really talking about your practice? Again, a ten team time tends to be kind of, well, did we grade the benchmark data and have we uploaded it to the robot computer, you know? And I think that what Karen and I see is a really, really troubling problem. Um, and we've seen this, I think Karen identified it best, being kind of happening in the last five years. The, lang a, the, the language of DESE is, is now, they now speak to core and non-core. And I remember when they first started speaking about that, I was really frustrated and I went immediately to the principal and said, yeah, but I'm core. You're telling me I'm not core? And how many of you have heard the onion analogy? Who uses Alexis core and non-core? Core? I had. Do you guys in your maybe? Who? Oh, maybe it's only our district. Hmm. Um, you don't. That's so interesting. So in our district and other districts, there's. I'm so grateful that nobody in this classroom has this, but there's very much sort of the. It's whatever the state of Massachusetts tests is core, right? So it's math. It's English. Um, and whatever MCAS, whatever so you've MCAS. got your science, science and technology, mystery, is that a right? Bit. So your core, you're protected, you're valuable, right? That's my obvious, you know. But everyone else is kind of non-core, and we use that language in the in at Lennox. And uh, as a former ELL person, I really bristle at it. And, sh and Karen's going to share this ridiculous and <laughs> onion analogy. So I remember five years ago going to the principal saying. But, what do you mean? Like, I'm core. I'm in everything. I can fit everything. I can do science. I can do math. I can do technology. What do you, what do you, I'm core. I'm right in the middle of all of it. And they're like, well, no, there's the center core. And you're more on the outer core, like an onion. And, and then Alexis and was, was like, like, what, and peel you away? I'm like, <laughs> no. So we've got to try to, to stay attached to that onion and center to the, more center to the core than I like to maybe think some people push us. But, um, but I mean, the, the, real, the real hardship of it is that you feel that in, in the environment of, the, of which you're working. So you know that some core teachers don't have time. And they don't because they're being dr driven by that data and the performance. And then I'm not core, so wow, how wonderful. I can take field trips. Right. I can collaborate. I can do all these wonderful things. But at the same time, I'm trying to also show them that I am a vital part of every other discipline as well. And we do need to balance these, these little kids' brains with the left and the right-hand side. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting dynamic when, when our school began talking about core versus non-core. Um, but I'm up over the hump, but I'm still always going to be at every scheduling meeting there is to make sure that I don't get scheduled out in any way. Right. And I think that the real disservice that we're doing when we have, when we think within this framework is that um, I imagine everyone sees this K through 12, but certainly we see this at the high school level particularly, where students who get to work with Mr. Miller in the wood shop, that's the only reason they showed up to school that day. Mm -hmm. And that's not a joke, right? There's a lot of students that I can't make, tell you specifics about that will say, I need to go into your dark room today, and I need to go now. And that's great. They need that privacy. They need that distance from everybody else. And they also need that opportunity of expression that, they're, that, that the spotlight's not on them, and they can't be wrong. So it is, and, and our administrators 
definitely recognize that and they'll say that they're not going to cut our, our woodshop program, they're not going to cut our art program because they know that that's what brings kids to school. And I think it's wonderful that our administrators recognize it. I just hope right. that we want to keep that conversation through Massachusetts kind of going because it's something that we find troubling. So in all of these angles of life and disciplines, I tend to collaborate as much and as often as I can. So last year was the town of Lenox 250th anniversary and again I, I didn't have necessarily that thought that came to me when I was doing the budget because the budget you plan pretty much as soon as the school year starts for the following year. Um, so I wrote a grant and Michael Melly, who you can see back there, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Melly, but he's pretty famous for his straw sculptures around. Um, so we had the seventh grade social studies class research some historical figures from our history and then they took hold of this project and then we had Michael Melly come in for two days but I needed far more than just those seventh grade. The, there were 60 kids. I needed more than 60 bodies to help make these 13 sculptures. So we just had everybody come. Every hour, a new group of kids came. And they kind of just did, they were more direction driven, whereas the seventh graders owned it. They knew exactly what was being made and what positions they were in. And this um, is just how I think a great picture. That's how they were all day. It was a miserable day. It was freezing out. It was cold out, but I think their energy and somehow my camera allowed us to capture the, the happiness that they all had. Um, the top right is a collaboration with the French class when they were making masks and um, they had to make their own mask, design their own mask. They were studying African culture within that. Um, and then this is <laughs> Um, another French project where they were looking at museums in Paris and I m my downfall is certainly architecture I'm not good at that I'm not well versed in it but I love to look at it and I love to learn more about it so we work on this project of rebuilding some of those museums with some architectural changes um, and then I bring in a guest architect to talk to the students about architecture so those are just a few examples of some of our every year this is the Louvre, because you know the Louvre is shoddy, you know, <laughs> construction as it is. <laughs> um, so we wanted to kind of chat a little bit more um, about what makes successful collaboration, because um, one thing that Karen and I certainly in the art room and in the library um, both see very frequently and quite and it sort of is, a, is frustrating to us is that a lot of people want right collaboration and interdisc is kind of a buzzword in education everybody wants to collaborate but oftentimes in our experience that frequently happens that them trudging down and interrupting the art class for materials equals collaboration with the art teacher or I really love it when a teacher and I chat about a lesson the teacher comes and I'm assuming we're gonna team teach and we're gonna be there and then amazingly most often I think every librarian in the room can recognize this the teacher leaves <laughs> and it's sometimes it says as, 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 as it's like I'm just gonna go for coffee I'll be right back <laughs> like 45 minutes later I'm like right honey it's like what you Great Barrington for that coffee. So that, of course, um, so I guess we want to share with you that we have a lot of we have a lot of experience with obstacles in this department. <laughs> so um, we are lucky that we work with each other. We are lucky that um, it tends to be a really fruitful relationship. But we have far more uh, examples where people really want to collaborate, but it, it does take time and effort. So these are some of the things that we think that you need. Um, obviously, we're teaching, this is your language teachers, right? You have to first identify the student learning goal. Like, what's the point? Why are you doing this? What is it in your students' uh, skill set uh, and their experience that you need to capitalize on, you need to, um, you know, kind of encourage? Then, as we talked earlier, you have to kind of be really aware, right? This is not a linear process. This is kind of a continual process. But what, if, if it's architecture for Karen and if it's art for me, um, what things, and lots of other things for me, actually, but um, what things do I need to reach out to others for help with, right? So to be kind of open about that is really uh, helpful going into a project. 
Um, and then, of course, it's to find a co-collaborator. It might be a person down the hall from you, but it also might not be. Um, it might be, I'm going to talk a little bit about a program I did at the Caretaker Farm. It might be a local farm, a local organization, a local museum. Um, it might not be a person in your building. Um, uh, and then sort of Karen has some thoughts about, you know, what you really need to make it work. So the most important thing is communication. So you can't have that person turning on their heels and walking away because then again you've lost that communication piece of if somebody in the class has a question and again you're not with them every day, you're here for this project. You need that cooperation right. and you need to not just communicate while their kids are there but touch base with each other and communicate throughout the process so that you can keep that process moving forward. Um, right. Can I interrupt for one second? Yes. I just realized two things. It also it speaks to that third space, that communication speaks to that third space that uh, Dieter Lisi and Black spoke about, right? That it's not just, um, you know, they were talking about that third space when you're talking about pairing the text with the image, that you're not just doing the same thing, you're actually trying to create a new route. So that's an, a, a big piece. Oh, and the other piece is that when that teacher leaves, it's, for me, I always try to look at le learning through what we're modeling to our students. When that teacher leaves the library, when that teacher leaves the art room, I don't care if they meant it or not, that message to students is, I don't have time for this. And I think we have to be really aware of that in everything we do in the classroom is being watched by eyes who are soaking it up. And when that happens, it's really problematic to me. You are telling me you're, you're perpetuating this binary of core versus non-core, my work versus your work, and I don't care if you're not aware of it or not, we need to be aware of it and be supportive, again, creating a really supportive work environment, and mainly I, for the students. I feel it dilutes that, that opportunity for the kids to see, so the investment on, on a professional level has faded, but now the students see that, that teacher leaving, and now they wonder, well, how important is this project anyway? I, mean, I was with them all along. It, right? So now that they're leaving, like, I might as well just goof off and just do whatever I want, because they don't see that teacher still investing their time and energy into what they're currently doing. So really, the basis of pretty much everything I do in art is, is it's based off of respect, not just for the students and my colleagues, but also the projects, the materials, and everything that we work with and whoever we work with. So if we can breed that idea of respect for each other and keep that genuine, the kids will feel it, and then they'll perform the best that they can and give their best effort, because that's all we can ask from them. Right. And I think that as you know, and I'm sure you know this already, but as you go and you have, if you realize that there's an imbalance of power, or not a power, if there's an imbalance of interest, then maybe try again, but, you know, then just know that I've learned the hard way that you don't keep knocking that door down. You just say, okay, that door is closed. And you try to just kind of pick yourself up and move forward. Um, so this is kind of, we were trying to think what might be helpful to you. Um, and this is a, you know, sort of our sloppy, probably non-linear process for students. Um, and I'm going to start with a story about Melville Dewey. Can I have a show of hands for my librarians? Who, how many librarians do I have? All right. Well, my biggest, I don't know if you share this, fellow librarians or not, but um, I just recently, uh, we had a, a long-term sub in our building. He's like, oh, you're the librarian, huh? I wasn't expecting you, right? It's like, oh, you're expecting an ancient woman, you know, smelled of mothballs and, you know. I, I remember a parent really said to me how great it must be that I can sit at my desk and read all day. I was like, yeah. I was like, it's amazing. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Don't know why you didn't do it. Um, so the thing I hate the most, because it feels so hackneyed and so, so cliche, is that the truth is I have to teach students the Dewey Decimal System. And I hate it because it's like, I feel like I should just pass out mouth moth balls and put my head in a bun and, you know, I really don't like it. And who really wants to learn it? I mean, I love, I'm, I'm totally, actually, I'm a huge fan of Melville Dewey. I think he was a nut. He was a racist, dead white person, but he was really brilliant. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for this gentleman. His classification system is most used widely in the, in the country far more than the Library of Congress. It's amazing what he did. We still use it today. It's like unheard of in systems. Um, but, um, so I had to figure out, okay, how am I going to teach this to students? They don't care, but they do have to figure this out, and this is so boring, and I hate myself now. <laughs> so I did a little bit of research on Melville Dewey, and this is the story I tell them. 
Melville Dewey was born in upstate, this is all true, Melville Dewey was born in upstate New York, he was born about 1862, I think, and when he was a young boy, his school, there was a fire in his school, and I asked his children, what are you supposed to do when there's a fire in the school? They all say, run away, I say, yes. Okay, so did Melville Dewey do that? No, he did not. Anybody want to guess? Who doesn't know the story? Yes, he ran into the flames and he grabbed all these books. And I was like, isn't he a nut job? And they're like, yes, he's definitely a nut job. <laughs> so what happened is that because of his valiant or idiotic, however you prefer to think of it, his uh, running into the, you know, not exiting the fire when he should have, he developed a terrible uh, bronchial condition. And his mother took him to the doctor and the doctor said, so lovely, he said, well, you're going to die in a year, kid. So he, because remember, he's a bit of a different kind of fellow, he was like, great, I've got a year to live. I'm going to be as efficient as, as I possibly can about everything in my life. <laughs> so he was born M-E-L-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. He was like, strike the final L-E. We don't have time for it. I only have a year. The clock's ticking. Tick tock. Get rid of the L and the E. And he wanted to change, so he, he created a new form of spelling. It didn't stick. He used to spell his name D-U-I didn't really work, that was kind of messy. He just finally came to his senses. But anyway, turns out Doc was wrong, ended up going to Amherst College. Anybody know where Amherst College? Yeah, we've been to Amherst College, yeah, you know, you hear little stories. And then finally I simply say, I don't do the boring, you know, 398.2 folk tales. But you know, at least I sort of give them a look. There's a, you know, there's a classification system and how do you, you know, I try to have them think, well, how do you want to, how do you access nonfiction versus fiction? So anyway, so that's what I do. And I realize that there's actually great value in finding, again, going back to the beginning, that story. What's that story? So if you, you don't have to, but you see this little thing about O. Henry, right? I get, right, you guys, if you go, those, those of you who work with uh, sixth graders, you get a bunch of, um, I have chill, I have boys, and I get a bunch of sixth grade boys, I'm going to read a book to you children. They're just like, holy cow, right? They're just sitting at you, sort of giving you daggers. They don't actually, initially, before you start reading, they do not want you to read to them. They think, you know. But then you tell them that O. Henry uh, stole from a bank escaped to uh, uh, Central America, you know, was jailed, all of a sudden you have these little eyes, you know, she's going to read me the story of this guy who was in prison for years, you know, for theft. And all of a sudden you've got them kind of captivated. So one thing that we've done, um, whenever we, Karen and I embark on a project together, we begin, of course, it's a very natural, right, this is nothing groundbreaking in the field of education, but you start with the biographical information, but for us it's always trying to focus on that one interesting story. They don't, you don't need anything else, right? Just one story that they'll remember. So Karen's going to speak about what we've done with, um, do you want to speak about Jerry Pinckney? Sure. So uh, with Jerry Pinckney, it actually began in the library because as much as I wanted all of those sixth grade students, I don't get them all year. So I had to figure out how am I going to how am I going to allow this artist to come in and give him the respect he deserves and not the blank stares. He, the kids need to know who he is and they need to know about him. So who can help me. Oh, Miss Kennedy, you always help me. Let's work together on this. You see the reading classes every week. Do you think that you could help me teach them, introduce them to Jerry Pinckney? So she came up with what's in your packet, this right. Jerry Pinckney Very straightforward, author illustrator study including um, you know, very specific places to go to, but they could listen to things, they could read things. They had a basis. They had a base when he came in that they were excited to see him. They had already met him. And actually, one, one of our students was really cute, because he, what did he ask? Was it about the dyslexia? I don't remember. He asked them something, and they were like, no, 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 we already heard that. Oh, we, yeah. we already know. <laughs> yeah. He hadn't told them yet, but right. they heard it through his interview on one of his videos. Right. Um, but they were already like, yeah, we heard that, so go on. Right, right. Like, like, carry on. on. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. It was also really interesting. Um, I forgot about it until I scanned the sheet just now. Jerry Pinkney suffered from dyslexia when he was a child. How amazing to bring in a this incredibly famous person and to, for him to say you know how many of those children know they, I have dyslexia right they're not going to tell you that but they were so so that was sort of the moment that I fixed on right it doesn't care about his dates or things like that but that moment is really is really good also do we have I don't mean to I'm we what don't how are we doing time. the time yeah Rockwell staff 
Keep going. Yeah, keep, keep going. Keep going. We're okay. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Tom Daly comes. <laughs> the children line out the door. <laughs> so then is Norman Rockwell, <laughs> um, and that's one of my favorite units to teach. Honestly, it truly is. It's not just because I'm here at the Rockwell Museum, but it's a a, a passion I have for not only our local artists, but I find his life fascinating. So um, depending on which grade I'm talking to, we have a variety of different things that I created. Um, and this is based off of the museum's biography that's in your packet. That's my grade two to four biography. Um, and it's simplified and we read it together. Well, when I, I introduce this lesson to my middle schoolers, we schedule time in the library and we block it so nobody else can come in and interrupt us. And we have the opportunity to have these tables. And we pull out a pile of books. And we also have computers in the kind of the center console area. And Alexis puts on some quiet music. And I give them the second handout in there, which is that middle school one. And basically give them about 15 minutes to explore. And exploring could be looking through the books, or it could be where I've told them at the bottom how to get to the, the online collections. So those people who are drawn to the computer, like, go ahead, go to the computer and check them out there. Those of you that want to feel that book, go ahead. And if you see your neighbor has an interesting picture, go ahead, look at it with them. And then eventually find one and write it down and just respond to it can't be wrong just respond you could respond to oh well, I have a dog like that or you could respond like hmm what the heck's going on here but then after that about 10 15 minutes of exploration then we share so we gossip about what they just learned and we come back together like a big giant dining room table and they say oh yeah this is the picture I looked at and then they share what they thought and anybody else has the opportunity to respectfully respectfully give a comment like, oh, I did that one too. Great. So what did you think? Okay, so should we move on? And then somebody else may come up with some sort of interesting fact that they learned in history. And then that's that teachable moment where we can then say, right, you know what? There's another one that we'll look at next class. Now that you said that, I'm going to write that down, and I'll take advantage of what you just said, and I'm actually going to take a little side note next class to fulfill your interest, because you said it, you're interested. So I'm going to go there with you. So those are a few things from Rockwell, um, on Rockwell. And then this wonderful exhibit that's currently upstairs that we saw. Um, the Rockwell has wonderful things to give educators. So this is from that book of the, the I going to bottle the, <laughs> the collection, the catalog exhibition of the catalog. exhibition. Um, and then on the back of it includes his mission statement. So when I read the kids his mission statement, it just makes them stop and think for a minute about imagination and that they should always hold on to that. You're never too old. You're never too old to remember whatever it was that inspired you. So, and then the following one, The Rays, is directly from an exhibit that was here, gosh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. Yeah, did anyone see um, that beautiful uh, exhibition here on Curious George? It's another moment, here's another incredible moment with picture books, sort of going back to our theme of how illustrated text can be so valuable. So what I learned, thanks to the Rockwell, from that exhibition, so you would think, okay, high school history, and uh, Curious George does not compute, right? Well, thanks to Louise, this beautiful book by Louise Borden, who Rockwell, um, Norman Rockwell had here, she spoke. Um, did any, does anyone know the story of the Rays? Yes, yeah, it's a like an, another wonderful way that I don't care who you are, you're going to be interested in this. Very quickly, um, the Rays were living in Europe at the time of World War II. They were Jewish, they were escaping persecution, and in this incredible moment, you know, sort of uh, f uh, fact is more bizarre, what is that expression? Fact is uh, more something than... Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, they were stopped by, you know, by um, police, and it was thanks to the sketches of this little monkey, you know, what, how much harm could they possibly do to the Fuhrer, you know, with this little monkey. And they escaped, eventually came to New York City, and now we read Curious Stories to our students. But what a phenomenal way, so, so A, there's these phenomenal nonfiction books. I highly recommend this, right? Common Core is all about nonfiction. Read this to your students, share this with your students, and it's an incredible story. Um, 
The second step we're really not going to talk about because it's pretty self-explanatory, right? All the things we've kind of talked about, you know, putting them, I believe, really in diversity of platform. Um, so books, like we said, you know, have them listen, read, um, you know, lots of things. Um, again, we don't really have to talk about this because it's pretty straight. You know, this is sort of this is what educators do. We brainstorm, we sketch, we write, we illustrated. Um, Another project we did that we collaborated on, um, Sixth Graders Read Seed Folks by Paul Fleischman. Does anyone know that? It's a, it's a story of multiple characters who are brought together and they grow a community garden. Well, we had our students go up to Caretaker Farm in Williamstown. It's a community-supported agricultural a CSA farm. They did a day of hands-on learning. And this, I don't, ha what, I don't think, I'll read it. Should I read yeah. it? How are we doing for time? I'd love the time. I feel great. <laughs> I feel much better about the time. Two. Oh, it's two. Oh, it's two. Okay, that's all right. Okay, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. All right, perfect. Thanks. Sorry. Um, this little girl writes, when I was at Caretaker Farm, I saw four huge pigs. They were all pink except for one mischievous black one. When I was about to pet the black one's rough nose, it looked me straight in the eye and then took off, running playfully, and ran around at least twice, then came back to me to be pet. It was really cute. When it looked at me, it looked at me cross-eyed and then ran off. That pig and the awkward running chickens were my favorite sights to see at Caretaker Farm. <laughs> So what you need to notice is that this is the brilliance of my colleague Karen. The title of that is The Artist's Reflections on Our Field Trip to Caretaker Farm. Because Lydia had indeed, after visiting the farm, doing all this hands-on, um, that you know, the students had about an hour of work that they actually did to experience what it's like to be a farmer, um, they came back to the classroom and with Karen, they did illustrations. And we chose this one to um, illustrate that year's publication. And on the inside cover is this beautiful beautiful little reflection, the artist's reflection, sort of much, very much as you see, uh, you know, next to Rockwell, this little slip that lets the artist sort of t say what she was thinking about as she had that moment. Um, and I think that, I think it's very important for Karen and I, and probably all of, for all of you to have those little moments and, you know, create that space where students can have a, a real life interaction with hands in the soil and hands in the dirt and then come back at, you know, come back from that experience and think about it. How does it connect to what they read? How does it connect to what they're learning in art? What elements of design can they use in their cover? And then how do they, ref you know, how do they um, reflect upon their own uh, uh, drawing? So, um, you know, obviously visit if possible, but it might be a virtual visit, right? It might be a Skype. It might be simply, it might simply be getting on the Norman Rockwell's museum and looking at their digital collection, or as so many institutions have, you know, online content. Um, sharing, publishing, displaying, you're all educators, you know how valuable it is to students to be able to see on the wall, again, whether it's virtual or, um, what's the opposite of virtual, real? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> uh, you know, see their name, right? I mean, we know this, you know this, that's when they get excited and that's when they have ownership and when you know that both teachers are sort of saying this is important, you know that they feel that that's important and they, get, they take so much pride in that. Um, and that's, of course, why we got into education. So another interesting aha moment was that we kind of kept cycling back as we were thinking about what we wanted to share with you today. And we were like, oh, yeah, remember that problem about that we see continuously about students not being willing to dive in? We kind of turned to each other. We're like, yeah, but in all these projects, we never had that problem. So shoot. <laughs> right, like how, <laughs> and then we actually realize, right, that that's the, I don't know if that's the answer, because I think that's too, that's a little bit, that's taking too much credit. I don't think that, I don't think that there's, that's necessarily the answer. But I think maybe when we slow down, right, when we say, you're going to do this in the English classroom, you're going to do this in the library, you're going to do this in the art room, then we're going to go take a field trip, if possible, or we're going to just have more time to explore this. And when you have educators who are equally invested and you're able to kind of slow down and show, not show, but model the value of interdisciplinary <laughs> connections, I might not be wrong, we might not, or we might not be right, but we think that there's, that somehow creates a space where that joy of learning can kind of trickle in. Um, so, that was sort of an interesting, we weren't expecting that slide to pop up because we actually didn't, we didn't start out with that realization. Um, but I think it's actually when you, this constant mad rush to produce, 
is not helpful for anybody. So that's what we found in our practice. So this was a book that Alexis bought and showed me. And I said, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And I just read this to my sixth graders who were leaving me, sadly. But I'll get, I'm getting a new group in. And basically, it's a book of mistakes. Like, that mistake, it's like a Bob Ross. It's a happy accident. It will turn into something else. So this is something I read to them, just saying, carry on. Don't stop. That's why your sketchbook is full of bad drawings, because they turn into something else. They'll turn into wonderful things, but they are always wonderful ideas. And then I was at um, Barnes and Nobles, and I took a, a picture of this and sent it to Alexis and said, did you know that there's books about like what you do with an idea and what you do when you have a problem? And what's the other one? What you do? Uh, I can't remember. They're Somebody wonderful. Does anybody know these books? They're, they're excellent, excellent, excellent They're wonderful, books. but I was like, wow, that makes me scratch my head because they don't know what to do with their idea. <laughs> Which I think goes hmm. back to the anxiety. Isn't that interesting? Kind of interesting? So now we need to help them get past the idea and into the actual work of it. Right. So and these we, are great. Yeah, please, if you do nothing, take a look at these books <laughs> because they really are so incredibly valuable. And again... I could say, oh, this looks quite elementary in its presentation. It's good for everybody, you know? <laughs> Bring it to your home to your, you know, 18-year-old. Um, and I will share with you, this is our final slide. Um, you go, thank, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> and I wonder, Sue Lynch may have heard this. Um, this is a metaphor I want to share with you about the apple. So if you're not really sure, if you are feeling unsure about diving in, think about the apple. This is a story that I learned at some li uh, li library professional development in the past few years. Um, the woman said to us, she said, well, this is under the pretext of kind of how do you connect with people, you know, how do you, how do you better your practice. She said, well, think about the apple. She said, I don't think there's any wrong way to eat an apple, but I've never heard of anybody eating it in one bite, and I've also never heard of anybody starting at the bruise. So that's been so helpful to me in my practice, that all those people, all those teachers that drop off the children and leave, Right, all the people that say, oh, I need some paste, and then, you know, they're gone. To me, those are the bruises, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. You know, I don't accept perfect, I don't ex accept, no, ex expect perfection. Um, but I, and it's sort of like, I've gotten away from it. Okay, I'm not going to eat that part. <laughs> and I also don't feel like I have to do the whole thing at once. So that's been a really helpful metaphor for me, and I hope perhaps maybe it's uh, powerful for you. And that's it. We just want to thank you so much for your time. It's been really <coughs> amazing to get to be here with you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Karen and Alexis. Does yeah. anybody have any questions or do you want to share uh, stories or comments based yeah. on what you just heard? Yeah, I just have a question because if you get support from your administrators, this can work really well. But we all have administrators who are. You know, Less than supportive. <laughs> so, I mean, how did you get support? Can I jump in for one second? Often we get silence, uh, we get approval by silence. Let's just put it that way. Go ahead. Yep, absolutely. Yep, go ahead. So, and like I said, I got support by finding my own grants. Almost every year I find some sort of grant or some sort of partnership. Um, you, f you figure out who, who are the entities that are willing to donate or give you money or give you time. Um, but I feel that's our greatest support is uh, them, them allowing us to, to do that and, and silence is approval. So I take it as a positive. I also think that another very good piece of advice professionally that was given me years ago was I was, having, I was really having a hard time in my role from my transition from being a classroom teacher to being the librarian. And there were far more challenges than I thought it would be switching because I thought, oh, you know, I'm just moving around. But it's actually, in many ways, it's sort of apples and oranges in my experience. And this older gentleman who had been teaching his whole life, he said, why do you think you don't have the power to do that? I was like, well, I, I, I don't know. You know. No one told me I could. He was like, you just have to take that power. And I often, when we do something like this, I extrapolate it out. If you create a, a, a valuable learning moment, nobody's going to say, right? Sometimes I feel like, what am I trying to say here? Sometimes I feel that we just go ahead and I just go ahead and do it. And I don't ask for permission. You know, obviously field trips are different. But I'm saying if you're doing something in your classroom, just do it. 
right? And then you, know, you don't tell anybody about it. You just do it because you know it's good educational practice. You know you have buy and buy from your students. And you know that at the end of this, your parents are going to be super supportive. And you know that at the end of the day, you can justify it with the standards, right? There's right. so many of them. And you so can pick we one. just kind of do it, right? <laughs> the drop-down menu. Oh. And so often I feel like we just do it. You know, I don't, I've stopped, and maybe this is my personality, uh, maybe it's my, the makeup of my district, but I don't often ask permission. And I just, I've been doing this long enough, I say it with conviction, I say it with force, uh, and often I, I don't ever ask permission. And I think that's actually the mo been the most liberating. And I think that I had to kind of do a change in the way I was thinking. I think, all right, there's a lot. I have to be the good girl. I have to follow the rules. That was for me. It was true until this one person said, well, why don't you just take, like, you have far more power than you think you do. Just go ahead and do it. And as long as that's a good thing for the students, no one's going to, you know, that would be a, that would be a, I think, a PR faux pas on the administrator's steps. Or, uh, you know, how that helps. Yeah. Does anybody, we'd love to hear from others who have done something that they're particularly proud of. No pressure. We've thought about this a long time. <laughs> All right, thank All right, you thank very you. much. This is really an honor to be with you, so thank, thank you. you so much.